Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Monday, April 22nd, 2024. Alright, so first thing I want to mention today, we are kicking off our fundraiser at Antiwar.com. It is that time of year for us. Uh, it's been a little while since we've done a fundraiser. Um, so we're trying to raise $100,000 this time. We've done 80000 for our uh, usual fundraisers for the past few years. That's kind of the, the typical number. But, you know, costs have gone up a bit. This is kind of what we really need to do. And, and the fact that we haven't done a fundraiser in a while. One reason why costs have gone up a bit is because the weekend uh, has been there's been so much stuff going on that we've been uh, having a lot of people write for us on the weekends, the, t- the two days that I take off uh, to, you know, so we can keep updating the page. Um, so antiwar.com is entirely funded by our readers um, and now listeners of this show, since this show has been around for, it'll be two years, I think, in July uh, since I started this show. So I know we've picked up some new People, you know, who weren't familiar with antiwar.com until they started listening to this show. But this is how we get by. We have to do these fundraisers and we rely on people like you. Um, so if you go to antiwar.com slash donate, you can see the different ways that you can support us um, through credit card donation, PayPal, crypto uh, is always good. Um, so please, uh, if you can, help us out by going to antiwar.com slash donate and hopefully we can get through this pretty quick so we could focus on all of the uh, craziness that that is going on here. Um, so to get into the news, uh, one thing I want to, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I, I left the last show off kind of worried about the potential escalation between Iran and Israel. So I want to go over this story that Iranian officials are downplaying the Israeli attack. So Iranian officials have downplayed Israel's drone attack on Iranian territory, signaling that there will be no response. So Iran's foreign minister, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, uh, he spoke with NBC News on Friday. This was the, the day after. It was Thursday night. I guess it was early Friday morning in Iran that this attack happened. And then on Friday in New York, he's in New York for the, for the UN, uh, he did an interview with NBC News, and he said, quote, what happened last night was not a strike. They were more like toys that our children play with, not drones, end quote. So Iranian authorities said that three small drones were downed in the Isfahan province and did not report any damage. Um, so now there's other reports. Uh, one thing that the New York Times had, they cited unnamed Western and Iranian officials who said that an Iranian air defense system was damaged by an Israeli airstrike, but that claim has not been confirmed by Tehran, so they're citing Iranian sources, but officially Iran is not saying anything like that. Um, And the Iranian foreign minister would not acknowledge that Israel was behind the drone attack and said that Iran would only hit Israel if there were another escalation. He said, quote, as long as there is no new adventurism by Israel against our interests, then we are not going to have any new reactions, end quote. So on Sunday, Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said that Iranian forces had success in recent events, um, which is another sign that Tehran is not planning an escalation. He's, you know, saying that they've been successful against the Israelis, and he was referring to Iran's recent drone and missile attack on Israel, which, of course, was a response to Israel bombing the Iranian consulate in Damascus. So Khomeini said, quote, how many missiles were launched and how many of them hit their target is not the primary question. What really matters is, the Iran- is that Iran demonstrated its power during that operation. In the recent operation, the armed forces managed to minimize costs and maximize gains, end quote. So, of course, there is still a risk of escalation in the region. Israel and Hezbollah can continue to trade fire across the border. There's always the chance of Israel continuing to target Iranians in Syria. Also, that same night, if you remember, there was explosions reported in Syria and Iraq and Iran that same night. 
of, of the attack. It looks like the, the Iraq thing wasn't really much, but in Syria, uh, Israeli warplanes did hit uh, air defense systems, Syrian military air defense systems, and they reported some significant damage there. So there's always the risk that that continues and that they kill more Iranians in, in Syria. And you never know what Israel's going to do right now. Netanyahu is clearly trying to provoke a big war here. So who knows? They might attack Iran again. I think that is certainly a possibility. Um, so, you know, hopefully this thing doesn't explode. But for now, it looks like Iran is not going to uh, do anything over that that attack that happened early Friday morning. All right, so to get back to the top story here, the big news from the weekend, the House passes $95 billion in foreign war bills. So this article is from Will Porter. He covered uh, this for us over the weekend. U.S. lawmakers passed a raft of legislation containing some $95 billion in military aid for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, and they also approved the bill that will allow Washington to hand Kiev assets seized from Russia and pave the way for a ban on TikTok. The aid bills passed by a wide margin after separate votes on Saturday afternoon, with the $61 billion Ukraine legislation approved 311 to 112, though a thin majority of Republicans opposed the bill, accounting for all the 112 no votes. While one GOP rep voted present, it was ultimately adopted with bipartisan support. Not a single Democrat voted against it. Um, and then there was the other bill for Israel, $26 billion, and that passed in a vote of 366 to 58, with 21 Republicans and 20 and 37 Democrats in opposition. So for the Democrats, you have them, they're opposed. You, you have some progressives opposed to sending new aid to Israel, and that's not much, 37. I, I would I was hoping it would be more than that. Um, and then with the Republicans, I mean, the fact that 21 Republicans voted against aid to Israel um, is a lot, but at the same time, a lot of the, these are mostly, I think, Freedom Caucus people that are voting in opposition to this whole thing. They're unhappy that Johnson, that House Speaker, put all this stuff forward without getting any concessions from the Democrats on the on the border stuff. And or just like cutting spending, they're just like against the spending and stuff. And uh, so not so much a vote against Israel, although, you know, you have Thomas Massey, who has been consistently voting against all the Israel legislation. Um, and then there was an eight billion dollar bill. And I was looking at it before. It was like two billion for military aid for Taiwan. Another two billion to re replenish weapons that the U.S. sends to Taiwan, and then about three billion for submarine infrastructure spending. I think that's to go with the AUKUS thing. Um, that received the most support, with 385 votes in favor and 34 votes against it. Um, so it's interesting that the Taiwan, you know, the bill for the future war to prepare for the war with China, is the one that received. Uh, the most support. I actually just want to look. I don't think any Democrats um, voted against that either. Yeah, no Democrats voted against the China bill. It was all Republicans. I mean, you know, it goes to show there's all these you, you hear from Republicans all the time that the Democrats, you know, similar to what Democrats say about Republicans with Russia, Republicans say the Democrats are, you know, uh, whatever, you know, favor China for whatever reason. Um are puppets of Xi Jinping or something, but obviously they're all in on this new cold war with China. Um, so this is just about, it's just such a mess. And I mean, if you saw the videos, the Democrats brought in little Ukraine flags and were waving them in the chamber. I mean, it's just completely ridiculous. And, and all this is doing the $61 billion for Ukraine, you know, this comes as there's no hope for victory. Not even, not at all, uh, for Ukraine to push Russia out. This is just going to prolong, just ensure that more people are going to be killed, ensure that Ukraine's going to expand the draft and, and get as many people as they can to throw on the front lines. Um, you know, that's that's all this vote is going to do. This And so now, so now it goes to the Senate, and in the Senate, it's going to be all packed together in one bill. And I think that vote is going to happen on Tuesday, I believe. And then Biden has come out. He's so happy about this bill. So, he, of course, he's going to sign it right away. All right. So the next one here, another 
very bad thing happened over the weekend. Biden signs bill into law extending warrantless spying powers. So on Saturday, President Biden signed a bill into law extending Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, which gives the federal government the power to spy on Americans without a warrant. The Senate passed the Section 702 extension at 11.45 p.m. on Friday night, 15 minutes before the spy tool was set to expire. Even though it was going to expire, the Biden administration was saying that they could use it for another year because the the FISA court decided that. Um, But anyway, uh, this extends Section 702 for two years until April 2026. And the bill passed through the Senate in a vote of 60 to 34 with 17 Democrats and 16 Republicans and one independent um, voting against the spying powers. And a week earlier, the legislation passed the House in a vote of 273 to 147. So the way this works, it gives the federal government the ability to spy on Americans by allowing warrantless surveillance of foreign citizens and any U.S. citizens they communicate with. The surveillance allows the collection of emails, texts, and other types of digital communications. And I know whenever I discuss this, I always say this, but I mean, especially the, in this day and age, you know, I speak with people outside the country every day. I know, and, you know, my wife's Australian. She's always talking to her family. Um, so, you know, you don't need, and you don't even need to have family outside of the country to speak with people outside the country. It's pretty common for people to talk to other people online. Um, And that's the type of stuff that they can collect. So lawmakers in both chambers opposed to this surveillance, they tried to include an amendment that would require a warrant for collection of Americans' data, but the efforts failed. Uh, One change that was included in this legislation, though, there was one group of people uh, who uh, had, had the rules changed for them, and that was members of Congress. This bill requires that if a member of Congress becomes subject to Section 702 surveillance, they have to be notified. And that requirement does not extend to ordinary Americans, which is not really a surprise. But this just goes to show, I mean, these both of these stories, um, just how corrupt and uh, this Congress is and how little they actually care about Americans. Um. <clears throat> All right, so the next one here, Israel kills 22 in Rafah, including 18 children. So what does Israel do? Hours after the House approves this huge military aid bill for them, they launch strikes in Rafah. This was Saturday night into Sunday, and uh, the, the strikes killed 22 people, including 18 children. And this was reported by the Associated Press. They spoke with hospital workers in the area. So the bombardment came just hours after, as I just mentioned, um, the House passed this $26 billion bill. And out of that $26 billion, $17 billion is for military aid for Israel. So this sends a signal to Israel, the U.S. totally has your back. Just do whatever you want in Gaza. Nobody's going to stop you. Um, and one of these overnight strikes killed a man, his wife, and their three-year-old child. The woman was 30 weeks pregnant, and the medical staff at the nearby Kuwaiti hospital uh, was able to save the baby, so a very small, premature baby. Hopefully, the baby survives with all the other shortages and everything. It's really hard for premature uh, babies to to make it. Um, And then there was another strike that killed two women and 17 children. I mean, that's just a, a massacre of children, 17 children. And I mean, what is there to say about that? This this is what this aid, this is what the U.S. is supporting and enabling in Gaza. So Gaza's health ministry said on Sunday that the number of Palestinians killed in the Strip has reached 34,097 and 76,980 more have been wounded. This death toll is considered a low estimate since it, since it doesn't take into account the people who are dead under the rubble. So Rafa is packed with over 1 million Palestinian civilians, and it's been getting hit with near-daily Israeli strikes. I don't always cover when Israel bombs Rafa pretty often. I'm, I'm not always covering it. I mean, this was just so horrific that uh, I wrote a story on it. And Netanyahu has, of course, been threatening to invade the city. Um, and on Sunday, what was Netanyahu's response to getting this new aid from the U.S.? He 
He said thank you, and then he vowed to escalate in Gaza. He said, quote, In the coming days, we will increase the military and diplomatic pressure on Hamas because this is the only way to free our hostages and achieve our victory, end quote. All right. So the next one here, nearly 200 bodies found in mass grave at Khan Yunus Hospital. So this is Khan Yunus. If you remember, there was recently a mass grave found at the Al Shifa Hospital up in Gaza City. This is in the south. This article is from Al Jazeera. Palestinian civil defense crews have uncovered a mass grave inside the Nasser Medical Complex in Gaza's Khan Yunus with 180 bodies recovered so far uh, as Israel continues to bomb as Israel's continued bombardment of the devastated coastal enclave for more than six months. The discovery on Saturday and continuing into Sunday comes after the Israeli military withdrew its troops from the southern city on April 7th. Much of Khan Yunus is now in ruins after months of relentless Israeli bombardment and heavy fighting. Uh, So a reporter for Al Jazeera said, quote, In the hospital courtyard, civil defense members and paramedics have retrieved the 180 bodies buried In this mass grave by the Israeli military, the bodies include elderly women, children, and young men, end quote. Uh, So really just a horrific uh, discovery in Khan Yunus. And if you remember, when Palestinians first started returning to the city, they found it in in complete ruin. All right, so the next one here, Israeli forces kill 14 Palestinians in an assault on a West Bank camp. So the West Bank, I really have not been covering this much lately but it has been really bad lots of settler attacks settler rampages um palestinians getting kicked out of their homes and raids by israeli forces so this article is from middle east eye israeli forces withdrew from a refugee camp in the occupied west bank on saturday following a deadly two-day raid likened by palestinians to the intensity of second intifada attacks the assault began late on Thursday with Israeli armored vehicles and troops surrounding the Nur Shams refugee camp east of Tolkarm City. Uh, for more than 50 hours, Israeli forces maintained a siege on the camp while they shot at residents, arrested scores of people, and destroyed homes. Um, Palestinians, including those killed and wounded, were trapped inside the camp and without access to medical assistance for the duration of the raid as ambulances were blocked by Israeli forces. A volunteer paramedic was shot in his leg when attempting to reach a wounded man, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. And I know, I think uh, the Israelis said that some of their soldiers were wounded. um, But, yeah, it says nine. The Israeli military said nine soldiers were wounded in clashes with Palestinian fighters. Um, So, again, you know, if this was happening and and separate, you know, without this... these all these atrocities in Gaza, this would be a huge deal, just the situation in the West Bank in general. Um, all right, so the next one here, uh, so back to the Iran-Israel stuff. Um, actually, this is more of a regional escalation section. Israeli reservist dies of injuries from Wednesday Hezbollah attacks. So this article is from Jason Ditz. So on Wednesday, 18 Israelis were wounded, some severely in Arab al uh, Armche when it is a Hezbollah drone exploded. So this was last week, um, if you remember. I think I covered this. Uh, and one Israeli deputy commander uh, died uh, of the wounds that he sustained in that attack last week. Um, and Israel and Hezbollah have continued to be engaged in near-daily tit-for-tat attacks across the border. And each incident with casualties leads to retaliation. So you know, a lot more people have died on, on the Lebanon side than on the Israel side. So when you see a Israeli commander, deputy commander, uh, be get killed, this could mean, you know, an Israeli... Israel might escalate airstrikes uh, in, in Lebanon. Um, so, of course, the, the fire continued over the weekend. Um, Hamas took credit for some rocket fire out of Lebanon on Saturday. Um, that was on Sunday, actually. So uh, this situation continues to be very volatile. And the next one here, one killed in an explosion at an Iraqi base. This article is from Will Porter. So one Iraqi militia fighter was killed and eight others injured after a large explosion rocked a military base south of Baghdad, Iraqi officials said. Both Israel and the U.S. denied involvement in the incident. The blast erupted early on Saturday at the Kalsu base in Babil province, some 30 miles south of Baghdad. Um, so 
a member of the Popular Mobilization Forces was killed. That that's the PMF, which is a the kind of umbrella group of the Iraqi militias. That's part of the Iraqi security forces, and this is who the U.S. has been bombing in Iraq in recent months. Um, and the Iraqi military said that no drones or aircraft were detected at the time of the incident. Um, so they're investigating the cause of this blast. When this the news first broke, I think this was Friday night, or you know, it was early Saturday morning in Iraq, so Friday night here. Um, you know, it was one of those things. Some people assumed that it was more airstrikes or something, but they're they're saying that it it might not have been uh, airstrikes, and they're they're investigating the cause of the incident. All right, so the next one here, Israeli security chief slams lame attack on Iran. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone. Israeli National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir has mocked an Israeli attack on Iran as lame after Tehran thwarted a small IDF drone strike early on Friday. Um, So Ben-Gavir, if he's not happy, that's good. Uh, He, you know, we talk about him a lot. He's a real, he, uh... He's a real monster, um, and he leads the ultranationalist Jewish Power Party. And he's a very he's in a very powerful position in the Netanyahu government. He's the head of the police, head of the prisons. He was the one last week who was saying, you know, we got to start executing Palestinians to make room in in the prisons. He's you know these are the things that he says. So, uh, I think it is good to see that he's not happy with Israel's uh, attack on Iran. Uh, called it lame, and he he is urging Israel to go berserk in retaliation. Um, All right, so the next one here, the U.S. may send military advisors to Ukraine. So the U.S. is considering increasing its small military presence in Ukraine by sending up to 60 additional military advisors, Politico reported on Saturday. And this, of course, was the same day that the House approved $61 billion in spending for the proxy war. So 60 additional military advisors, that's a lot, because as far as I understand it, um, so, well, I'll get into that in a minute here, but uh, so Politico quoted four unnamed U.S. officials who said that the additional troops would support logistics and oversight efforts for the weapons that the U.S. is sending Ukraine. Pentagon spokesman Brigadier General Pat Ryder said that the potential deployment would augment U.S. personnel based at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. So this is the Pentagon spokesman. So the Pentagon is saying publicly that they're considering this. He said, quote, throughout this conflict, the DOD has reviewed and adjusted our presence in country as security conditions have evolved. Currently, we are considering sending several additional advisors to augment the Office of Defense Cooperation at the embassy, end quote. So that's the ODC. So the Office of Defense Cooperation and the Defense Attaché, that's military personnel who are based at the embassy. Um, And pretty much every embassy around the world has a a military officer stationed at it. And um, back in in the early days of of this war in 2022, towards the end, Uh, The Pentagon announced that ODC and Defense Attaché personnel were back in Ukraine. They briefly pulled them out right after the invasion, and they said that they were conducting on-site weapons inspections. Um, Not clear how close they get to the front lines, but as far as I understand it, this is just like a handful, maybe a dozen uh, U.S. military personnel here. So now they're saying that they're considering sending 60 more. I mean, that's a lot. You know, and of course, this is this is mission creep. You know, they're saying it wouldn't be a combat role, but this is how things start. You know, infamously, Vietnam started with military advisors. So this is definitely concerning. And this is just an example of them. No matter how bad it is, uh, the situation on the ground for the Ukrainians, they just keep digging in. I mean, they, this is just they're planning to keep this thing going for the long term. Um, so. All right. The next one here is some good news, if you believe it or not. Uh, The U.S. agrees to withdraw from Niger. So the Biden administration has agreed to a request from Niger's military-led government to withdraw U.S. troops from the West African nation. So Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell told Nigerian uh, Prime Minister Ali Lamine Zain that the U.S. planned to leave uh, during a meeting on Friday, um, when he met him on Friday. 
Campbell said, quote, we've agreed to begin conversations within days about how to develop a withdrawal plan. They've agreed that we do it in an orderly and responsible way, and we will need to probably dispatch folks to Niami to sit down and hash it out. And that, of course, will be a Defense Department project, end quote. So this decision comes about one month after Niger told the U.S. to leave. They ended military cooperation with the U.S., scrapped the the deal that they had with them, and said that the U.S. presence was no longer legally justified. And then you had the U.S. try to say, wait, 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 hang on a minute, and claim that they they weren't ordered to leave um, in basically a desperate attempt to stay because they have this big drone base, Air Base 201, which cost over $100 million to build, and I think it's only like five years old or something. Um, So they didn't want to give that up. And they, again, they're claiming that they weren't told to leave. Um, and then we had this whistleblower that I covered last week came out and said the U.S. refusal, you know, basically the U.S. is trying to paint this picture like there's some chance of a deal here, like they're not unwanted, unwelcome in Niger, when the fact is this is putting, you know, the U.S. troops aren't getting there, weren't getting relieved who were staying there. They were supposed to be relieved from their deployment, I I think this month. And then, but Niger stopped approving visas for, for that purpose. And so that came out. And now, uh, we have the, the U S saying that they're going to leave. So of course, you know, we gotta hope that they follow through with this. Um, I, again, I think it's pretty, very clear as the whistleblower said that Niger does not want them there. And I don't think they're going to be able to keep, try to keep like a few hundred or something. They might try to do something like that. And you have Niger building a more of a military relationship with Russia. And that was one of the things that led to Niger telling the U.S. to leave was because some U.S. officials came and complained about their relationship with Russia. And they, and it was after that meeting that they said that, that Niger said the U.S. was violating their sovereignty. So get out. Um, You know, that's the result of trying to control all these countries uh eventually you know you make people angry and it and it goes against the US interest of of maintaining this presence um so again let's hope that this follows through and they don't really try to drag their feet and that this just gets done um and you know the US is in talks with other West African countries to base drones there but a lot of these countries where there's been these military coups you know uh Mali Burkina Faso um I think Guinea uh, as well. They're not going to want the U.S. uh, some big drone base in their territory. But you do have, uh, there's reports that the U.S. has had talks with Benin, the Ivory Coast, and Ghana about uh, reaching some sort of deal. All right, so the last story here, the CIA director refuses to provide information on Assange spying. So this article is from Kevin Gostela at the Dissenter. So there's been this lawsuit going on. Um, about the CIA spying on people who are visiting Julian Assange through this Spanish security company known as UC Global. Um, And there's a lawsuit, and they're trying to get information about this from the CIA. And William Burns, the CIA director, is blocking it and claiming that it is, you know, in the national security interest not to release this information. So... Uh, CIA Director William Burns claimed that a lawsuit involving alleged spying on Americans who visited WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange must be dismissed or there could be serious and exceptionally grave damage to the national security of the United States. In a declaration that invokes the state secrets privilege, Burns also maintained that the CIA could not provide any explanation in open court for why the agency believes damage could occur if the lawsuit proceeds um so he's not refusing to say why you know what damage could occur here so four americans two attorneys and two journalists allege that the cia and cia director mike pompeo directed uc global a spanish security company to carry out spying operation against assange that violated their privacy uc global allegedly copied the contents of their electronic devices and provided the data to the cia In December, U.S. Judge John Coltol dismissed multiple claims that were filed against the CIA, uh, but Coltol also determined that the Americans had grounds to sue the CIA for violating their reasonable expectation of privacy under the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. 
Um, so it's an interesting case here. And I think the fact that the CIA was spying on Assange so intrusively should be enough for the British courts to throw out the extradition request. But of course, it's, it, it's not for them. Um, so, but this is just more evidence in the fact that we had this bombshell report from Yahoo News that Mike Pompeo plotted kidnapping and, and possibly killing, murdering Julian Assange over the, the Vault 7 release in 2017. Uh, all right, so that is it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from Melissa uh, Garaga for Earth Day, unveiling the ecological toll of war. One from Ted Snyder, Palestine and Iran, U.S. hegemony as self-interest. One from Roger D. Harris, U.S. reimposes illegal and inhumane oil sanctions on Venezuela. One from Brad Pierce, World War III isn't preordained no matter what they say. Uh, spotlight from John Hoffman, Netanyahu wants U.S. war with Iran. Uh, so please go check all of that out. And again, it is our fundraiser just starting off here. So if we could if we could start off strong with a nice big push in the beginning, uh, that would be really great. Um, if you can't do that, you could always just help us out by sharing this show, telling your friends about antiwar.com, like and subscribe and comment and all that stuff that I really appreciate. Follow us on social media, Instagram, uh, Twitter, all that stuff. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening. <laughs>